Okay, so welcome to the tutorial on um, information and machine learning. Um, I'm Martin Wainwright, and uh, I'll be giving this together with uh, Emmanuel Abbe. Um, so it's, it's a pleasure to give this tutorial. I think um, it's a lot of excitement these days with you know buzzwords like big data, massive data set, so on. Um, there's a lot of buzz, and part of it's hype, but I think there is actually genuine substance as well. There are, there are fundamental and interesting problems in this area of machine learning and big data. And uh, I think there are genuine opportunities for information theorists um, to make contributions here. So I guess our goal, broadly speaking, is, is to try and give you a flavor for, um, so first of all, some of the broad issues at the intersection between information and machine learning. But also more concretely, we'll try and drill down and focus on some particular problems. Um, so since I'm speaking first, I'll spend a little bit of time on some of the broader issues. Um, then I'll talk about some more particular problems. Emmanuel will drill even deeper and talk um, in quite a bit more depth about a few specific problems. Um, so I basically said this, that um, at this interface between information theory and, and statistical machine learning, there are lots of interesting problems. Um, one of the sort of fundamental issues that come up with big data sets, um, one of them, for those of you who were in the tutorial this morning, one of them is concentration of measure. Um, essentially, high dimensional problems are often remarkably predict predictable, um, much more so than you, you might expect naively. So that's sort of a blessing of dimensionality. Um, but there are also other curses. Um, curses of dimensionality, roughly this means that in high dimensions, if you don't have structure, you end up paying prices both computationally um, and statistically in terms of how many samples you have to collect. You pay prices that often grow exponentially in the, in the dimension of the problem. Um, so a theme in a lot of this work is that um, you're interested in problems that are high dimensional. We'll be looking at scaling laws in the same sort of way that information theorists look at scaling laws. We take limits over things and look at high dimensional problems. Um, but low dimensional structure is going to be important. And we'll see in each of the vignettes that depending on what kind of problem we look at, that low dimensional structure can take different forms. Um, for vectors, it can be sparsity. For graphs, it can be things like low degree or other structural properties of a graph. Um, for a matrix, it might be something about the eigenvalues. Um, if you're trying to estimate a function, let's say a density, it might be something about the derivatives or the smoothness of the function. Um, so structure is key. Um, and what is machine learning? How, how does one distinguish machine learning from statistics? Um, that's a very hard question. You can make enemies if you answer that question one way or the other. Um, but uh, I think it's fair to say machine learning is sort of part of computational statistics. Machine learning is dealing with statistical problems, um, but there's much more emphasis in it on algorithmic issues. Um, I think in some sense the analogy you might make is that classical mathematical statistics is very much like Shannon theory. It's, at least classically in the 50s, was focused on fundamentals. It didn't worry as much about how you actually implement something, how you actually compute something. Um, machine learning, we can think uh, in, in, as um, the analog of coding theory. It's sort of trying to figure out how do we actually implement things, what are the algorithmic problems that arise when we try and implement things, and um, concerns with things like memory and distributed constraints and so on. So there's much more of an emphasis on, on algorithms on the machine learning side. OK, so um, historically, of course, there's, there's always been a very rich intersection between information theory and statistics. So here we're looking, of course, at, at Claude Shannon. But on the, the statistical side, the mathematical, mathematical side, um, Paul McGraw was someone who actually very early started to make substantive um, connections between information theory and statistics. Um, I guess following Shannon's publication in the late 40s, I think there was a lot of hype. And there were many people who tried to connect to information theory, but they made connections that were essentially shallow and somehow meaningless. Um, Kolmogorov was not a shallow person. He was a genius. And um, if you read one of his papers, I'll reference it later, um, from the 50s about approximation theory, he was making quite substantive connections between certain statistical problems that we'll talk about and the notion of capacity. 
So there's many nice connections, and for instance, there's a chapter in Cobra and Thomas that covers many of them, things like hypothesis testing, large deviations, Sanov's theorem, um, Fisher information, kolbach glibo divergence, connections between these um, statistical measures. Something that you might not have seen that we'll talk um, a bit later in the tutorial is the notion of metric entropy and how it connects to capacity and Fano's inequality. Um, so that's a connection between information theory and, and approximation theory, and this is something that's very important in learning problems that deal with non-parametric spaces. Um, a sort of broad takeaway, uh, I think, that you want to come away from this tutorial with is that lots of statistical estimation or learning problems, um, all of them can be thought in some way as, as a form of channel coding. It's not an orthodox form of channel coding. It's not one that involves necessarily bits, zeros, and ones that are being transmitted. It involves different things that are being transmitted. But it's useful to think about it as channel coding. Um, so in any learning problem, what we're trying to do is we're trying to estimate something. And I'll call that something a theta. Um, that could be a vector. That could be a matrix. That could be a graph. That could be a density function. It can be many different things depending on the application that we're interested in. Um, but what we think about is that if you fix some theta, then there's some probability distribution, I'll call it Q of theta, so we have a family of distributions indexed by theta, and I can draw samples from that distribution. Right, so the way to think about a learning problem is the following. You have some, this is abstract, but I'll, I'll give you many concrete illustrations of this abstract picture as we go along in the manual that will do well. Um, you have some space, capital theta, some space of objects. Um, think of that as your code book. It need not be a finite code book. It could be infinite, an infinite collection of code words. What you think is nature comes along and picks some code word, some member of theta star of this family. That code word tells you there's some channel, there's a Q theta star, and we can draw samples. I can draw random variables. In the idealized setting, those random variables are IID. So you can think of sampling, when you draw samples from a distribution, that's basically using a channel. And we have a family of channels indexed by theta. Now what do we get? We get a sequence x1 through xn of random variables that are drawn from the channel. We sort of think about these, these are in some sense noisy, they provide our children noisy information about this unknown parameter here, and we'd like to estimate it. Right, so an estimator is what? It's something that's going to take our data set, our samples one through n, and map it to some random quantity theta hat. Right? So this step you can think is like decoding. Um, decoding perhaps in a general sense because we might have a, a code book that's infinite. Right? So that's sort of the picture. Um, and the application is going to define our code book. The application is going to define our family of channels. Um, so here's a difference um, between learning problems and information theory. In information theory, we, we normally think the code book is a design parameter. Right? We spend a tremendous amount of time designing good codes. Um, in learning problems, that's not usually the right way to think of the problem. Sometimes that's the case. But usually, you just have to think, this is some collection of objects that exists in nature. And I'm trying to estimate it. I can't necessarily design that collection of objects. I have to accept what's given to me by nature. Um, the channel is defined by the sampling process. But aside from that difference, you have all these parallels. Estimation is really a form of decoding. You're trying to, you're trying to infer what was the index, what's the correct value of theta, theta star in this case, from which you were drawing samples. Um, so this kind of perspective dates back to Kolmogorov with, with lots of variations. Um, and what we'll see as we go on is just sort of how many different models we can get by playing with the different knobs here. Right? Code books or code words, these can be graphs. That, that will be our first example. Our second example will be vectors. And our third example it will be actually functions. Um, Emmanuel will talk about some examples that involve, again, both graphs, vectors, and matrices. Right, so depending on the problem that we're talking about, the set of code words or the code book will be different kinds of objects. Um, the channels, of course, are going to be different. They can be random graph models. 
They can be based on regression models. They can be element-wise probe models. You might have random projections of your data. There are many different kinds of sampling procedures for different data. But abstractly, these are just different kinds of channels. Um, just like we have BEC and BSC and AWGN, here we have many different kinds of channels. They're quite different than the channels we're used to in information theory, but abstractly, they are channels. Um, the closeness, how close is this theta hat to theta star? Um, in desirable cases, we can actually think of this as an exact decoding problem. We might have a discrete code book. My first example, I'll have a finite collection of graphs. And I can ask the question, is theta hat equal to theta star? What is the probability of correct decoding? Um, in other cases, we can't hope, if I have an infinite code book, I can't hope to get theta star exactly, but I can hope to be close. And so we might have norms, um, we might have a Hamming distance on the edges of the graph, or we might have other more complicated norms if we have functional estimation problems. Okay, so what does machine learning bring into this? Well, I mentioned this before, but really machine learning brings in algorithmic issues. Um, so somehow machine learning is the coding side of the problem. And um, really, for learning problems, we're interested in implementing these algorithms, right? We want to run them on big data sets. So somehow having efficient algorithms, they have to be polynomial time, and often they have to be quite low order polynomial time. If you have an algorithm that's like n to the 10, and n is a million, um, that's effectively an exponential time algorithm. So people are focusing a lot on low order polynomials. An interesting theoretical question is, um, are there gaps between the sort of unconstrained capacity, how well you can do with any estimator, even if it is exponential time, and an estimator that's polynomial time. Um, these are called computational barriers, and we'll see an example of, of these kinds of barriers. They do really exist in learning problems, and they're quite significant. Um, distributed procedures and privacy access issues, these are also very important, and I'll, I'll mention these later um, if we have some more time. Okay, so that's essentially the, the high-level um, overview. Um, what I'd like to do in the remainder of the tutorial is sort of give you three vignettes in which you'll see these themes reoccur, this sort of theme of estimation or learning as a kind of channel coding problem. And what we'll see is how information product techniques enter to these kind of unorthodox channel coding problems. And in the third vignette, we'll sort of see this notion of um, metric entropy and how when you connect it with something like Fano's inequality, you, you get a, a certain equation that tells you a fair bit about the optimal rates of estimation for a large class of problems. Um, Emmanuel will, will focus and drill down on a couple of other related problems, but again, with these broad themes in mind. Um, if there are questions as we go, I'm happy to take them. Um, Okay, so let's begin with our, our first sort of problem. Um, our first problem concerns graphs, and um, one motivation for the use of these graphs is, suppose you wanted to model um, an epidemic, you wanted to model disease, maybe you want to model MERS, how it might spread. Um, what you could do is you'd have a population of individuals, and you would assign each individual the binary variable. And it would be plus one if that person was infected, and minus one if they were healthy. And now if you have a large population, what you'd be interested in is, what you'd expect is that there would be a certain spatial structure to how people got infected, right? It would depend on sort of vectors of transmission, probably social things, who's interacting with whom, um, which areas are highly connected, let's say, by transportation links and so on. There's going to be a lot of spatial structure to how people get infected. Um, a simple example you can imagine is if you were out to dinner um, and you're eating, um, Let's suppose that you don't do it in the Chinese way, you don't share dishes, then maybe you might imagine that you're at dinner and every node is, you're just likely to get infected or not infected with some probability. There might be some weight theta that is your prior um, log ratio of getting infected, but there's no interaction with people that are next to you or anyone else in the population. Um, if we sort of shared where people were passing dishes to their left and right, you might imagine there was kind of a dependency structure where 
if your neighbor was infected, maybe both of your neighbors were infected, then you become more likely to be infected. And so what you can do is you now model this family of five random variables. Instead of just being a product distribution here, you now add some coupling terms. Um, this is an instance of what's known as the Easing model from physics. And you have a weight. This weight is going to sit on this edge, for instance. If this is variables 1 and 2, they have a weight theta 1, 2. And that tells you sort of how strong is the coupling. How likely is it that an infection here is going to spread to this node? And in the worst case, you can imagine you get a complete graph, right? That you're interacting with everybody. Dishes are being passed all over the table. And one person being infected will have some influence directly on everybody else at the table. So the way to think about this problem is, um, if we observe an epidemic, we observe samples plus minus ones of people being infected or not. And something we might be interested in is inferring what was this hidden graph? Right? These graphs, these are your code words. Right? Nature is fixing some graph. Our model is that given this graph, we're drawing samples according to this channel. And our observations are patterns of infection. We see people that are either healthy or diseased. And um, you can imagine if I, I wouldn't be doing it with five nodes, I'd be doing this with thousands or tens of thousands of nodes. Here I've gone up to something like 32 squared nodes. And um, I could plot them in a square just so we can see the spatial patterns. I could choose different underlying graphs and I could make very different samples. Right? These are obviously qualitatively different, as is that. And so the graph selection problem would be the following. Somebody gives you a, a collection, a large number of samples. They're from some fixed but unknown graph. You don't know the graph. That's the code word. And you'd like to basically search over all the space of all graphs. And decoding means you'd like to figure out what's the graph that's generating this data. Um, so here, you, this is, for instance, if I had nine samples. Here, they're not from a fixed graph. Here, you can see, obviously, there are three different graphs that underlie this data. This is very obvious. This is totally artificial. This is not how real data looks. But this gives you a sense that it's an inverse problem where you observe samples and you're trying to go back um, to graphs. So in this case, the underlying graphs was I had a, a lattice, a nearest neighbor lattice that was generating three of the samples. Um, three of them were just independent. Everybody was just flipping a coin and becoming diseased or unhealthy. And three of them from this graph, a sort of strangely constructed graph with some um, areas of very strong dependency. OK, so a little more formally, what is this problem? Um, this is a, a well-known instance of what's called model selection. Um, what model selection means in learning problems is you have a family of models. In this case, our models are indexed by graphs. You observe samples from one of your models, and you want to choose the correct model. In this case, we want to choose the correct graph. So how do our channels look? Our channels look like this. Somebody gives you an unknown graph. They, be, they give you weights. These are sort of log odds that a given node gets infected. And these, these are the most important. For pairs S and T that are in the edge set of your graph, you have a coupling parameter. It's non-zero. These are unknown. The structure of the graph and the weights are not known to you. And um, what would you like to do? Well, somebody's going to give us a data matrix. Right? So what is a data matrix? Um, we're going to have a total of p variables in our graph. And we're going to have a total of n samples. So if I take the samples and I vectorize them, I can put each sample in a row. I get a matrix that's n by p. In this simple case, it's a plus minus 1. It's a random matrix that's n by p. So that's what you see. And what you'd like to do, what is decoding? You'd like to construct a function that takes your data matrix and maps it to a random graph. And what you care about, you care about the probability that your estimator, this is your estimate, is it different from the truth or not? And it's the probability under n samples. Um, we'll analyze the case where the samples are all IID. Um, that's the simplest case, but of course, realistically, one can imagine cases where the samples over time obviously are going to be coupled, it will be dependence, and can get much more interesting than this toy setting. 
Okay, so this is our sort of first concrete illustration of that general framework, right? This is just a channel decoding problem where the code book is the set of graphs. Um, we might have it the set of all graphs on P nodes. That's actually a very large code book. What we're actually going to analyze is a code book in which it's the set of all graphs on P nodes that have maximum degree D. Um, the reason we do that is in practice, um, one's often interested in graphs that are relatively sparse, that you, know, you don't have everyone connected to everybody else. What you often expect is you have graphs that might have bounded degree, or maybe they have degree that's roughly logarithmic in the number of, of nodes. Um, so we're going to look at um, decoding over a code book of graphs with D, maximum degree D and um, P vertices. Okay, so this is a, a very classical problem, um, and there's lots of nice work. Let me just give you a brief overview. Um, yeah, so in addition to the slides, actually, that many of you already have, um, Emmanuel and I have also made up some um, written notes with text on each slide um, that we posted on our website that has much, much more detail um, that's, than uh, that is on the slides here. So I'll just go fairly quickly here, but certainly in the, the sources, there's much, much more detail. Um, if you know that your graph, if you knew a priori your graph was a tree, um, so a tree doesn't have cycles, that's a very special sort of code book, the set of all trees, then there's a very beautiful algorithm due to Xiao and Liu, this is a classic paper in the IT transactions from the 60s, that says you can solve the decoding problem exactly in polynomial time um, just by running the maximum weight spanning tree algorithm um, on your graph. So trees are very easy. Um, general graphs are, are quite a bit harder, um, and there's a broad class of methods that are, that are roughly based on the following idea, that when you write an equation like this one here, um, an equation like this encodes a lot of what are called conditional independence properties. And the important part of these properties are the following, that if I'm sitting here and I'm worried about am I going to get infected or not, if I look at all my neighbors in the graph, and I observe, are you infected or not, then conditioned on that observation, there's actually no further information in people that are two steps or more beyond me. Um, what that means in, in this graph, graphical model language is that your set of your neighbors is a Markov blanket. If you condition on it, it separates you from the rest of the graph. Um, what that means for graph selection is that if you can, for every node, if you have a way of figuring out who your neighbors are, then of course you can stitch together all the neighborhood sets and you can make an estimate of the graph. That's one way to build a graph estimate. Um, and so there's a, a very big class of methods that are basically based on local testing. What they do is they fix a node and then they look at some subset of neighbors and they say, conditioned on those people, am I independent of every other variable um, in my data set? And then I do this repeatedly. It's a multiple testing problem. I do it many, many times for many, many different subsets of the graph. Um, so a priori, it's not that efficient. If, if I knew that my neighborhood set was size D, I would have to run this algorithm on P minus 1. That's the set of people other than me. Choose D people. That's going to scale like P to the D. Um, if P is even fixed, but 20, that's of the order of P to the 20. That's not a practical algorithm in general. Um, to make it practical, people do various sort of clever fixes. Um, let me not talk in detail about this. is a very nice paper. There's more information about it in, in the notes that I'll hand out. Um, what I would like to talk to in, in some detail is these methods that are based on pseudo-likelihood. What do they do? Um, they essentially convert the problem of trying to find neighbors into a prediction problem. Um, what they say is, if in my data set I look at myself and I try and predict my own values based on subsets of my neighbors, I don't iterate over all subsets, but I um, solve a regression problem with a vector, one number for every one of my potential neighbors, but I put an L1 penalty on that regression vector. So I'm trying to make it sparse. I'm trying to make it have many zeros. I want it to be a, a de-sparse vector. Um, so this is, there's been a lot of work, of course, in machine learning, compressed sensing statistics on L1. L1 is a way of um, enforcing sparsity in a computationally um, feasible way. This is one use of such relaxations. 
So I'll show you how that method um, behaves in, in a couple slides. Um, let me just give you a, another concrete less toy example. Um, another kind of data that you might model in this way is you might model voting records of politicians. Right? A vote is a yes or a no. It's a plus or a minus one. Um, we could take a set of politicians, let's say P of them. We could take senators. In the US, there are 100 of them. And what do we get? We get samples over time. Each time a bill comes in, we get a vote. We get a sequence of plus minus ones. This is assuming that every senator votes. Um, in practice, that's not true. Senators are often abstaining for clever ways from votes, so it's actually a complicated missing data problem. Um, but if you had complete data, what you'd have is a matrix with 100 senators, and let's say you collect votes over a couple of years, you'd have some number of votes um, in the Senate. And you could use this um, neighborhood prediction method to fit a graph to this data. And this is what you do if you fit it um, to the Senate for 2004-2006 voting. Um, what do you see? Well, what do these colors mean? These mean Republicans. The algorithm didn't know that. I'm just coloring that so we can look at it. Um, Republicans are sort of uh, rather conservative individuals. Um, these are liberals. Well, relatively for the US, these are what are called liberals. Um, blue, Democrats. And what is yellow? Yellow is a uh, independent. And you can see there's sort of not complete bipartiteness, but you certainly see there's a lot more inter-party connectivity than cross-party. You also see interesting things like this. Here's an individual, this is a, a Democrat, who actually has several very strong edges to um, Republicans. And so you sort of, that makes you suspect this person is an outlier. Um, these are positive I haven't shown you in the plot whether the weights are positive or negative, but these are strong positive edges. This is someone who's, you know, if these Republicans vote plus, yes, that has a very strong influence on this person to vote. Um, so that's someone you might look at more carefully. And uh, if you do look at the data, you found out that this was Joe Lieberman, who was a Democrat in these years, but of course a few years later shifted to become an independent. Right, so the algorithm is sort of discovering this. This is machine learning. We've done nothing but input zero, minus ones and plus ones. We just downloaded this with a script from, um, from the web. These are now pretty much public. And the algorithm is sort of discovering anomalous behavior. Um, we could have maybe targeted Joe Lieberman and tried to you know, bend his arm to make him vote in a better way. Um, so let me talk about some theory. OK, so theory. Um, what people are doing a lot in machine learning and statistics these days is what's called high-dimensional theory. And for an information theorist, that's a very natural thing to do. It's, it's not what has been classically done in, in the area, but it makes perfect sense for an information theorist. So what people are doing is they're looking at sequences of problems. And I look at sequences of problems that are, in this case, indexed by P, the number of nodes in my graph, also D, the maximum degree but also indexed by n, the number of channel uses. Right? So there's a notion of n is the number of channel uses. There's a notion of the size of the code book. What we want to try and do is define some notion of rate. And if we can define the right notion of rate, then perhaps we can start talking about capacities. Now, what's challenging here is that in these sort of very heterogeneous, strange code books that we have, the correct notion of rate is not always obvious. It's not just that you count the number of code words. Um, things can be somewhat delicate. So you need to look at the scaling law to try and figure out what's actually going on. So let me show you some experiments um, in practice. So what are, we, what are we doing? Well, we're going to look at sequences of problems. So here is, we look at star graphs. These are graphs where you have one hub. The hub has degree three, and you've got nine nodes. I'm going to look at sequences where the hub always has degree basically p over 3. Okay? So that's going to be one sort of aspect of my scaling law. So I might look at a graph with 18 nodes, maximum degree 6, 30, maximum degree 10. I'm going to look at much bigger graphs in practice. Okay, so we're going to look at sequences of code books. And we're also going to look at sequences of sample sizes n, or sequences of channel uses. And what happens if you plot, so this is the method, this L1 regularized neighborhood regression. So what we're showing you here is we've implemented it. 
Um, this is on simulated data. It's not from Senate data. We're doing simulations to try and explore the scaling law. If you plot the probability of correctly decoding using this method, you plot it versus the number of samples, the number of channel uses. And you do it for three different size graphs. I'm drawing the graph. Um, what you see is not surprising. You see curves. Well, one thing you see is that this method, of course, if you have too few samples, it doesn't work. It returns the wrong graph. But there's a transition. It starts to work once the sample size is, is big enough. And what's not surprising is that if you have a bigger graph, if I have a graph with 225 nodes versus one with 64 nodes, you should need more data. You should need more channel uses to correctly decode in that case. Right? And the notion of rate is going to tell us exactly how many more samples we need as a function of P and P. So this is what happens if you take that same simulated data and you replot it on a rescaled axis. So I'm plotting again just the probability of being correct versus a control parameter. What is the control parameter? It's the sample size n divided by the degree, the maximum degree squared times log p, log of the number of nodes. And what this is telling you is that for some reason, and we have to prove this, for some reason that's the correct rescaling. That's the right order parameter that determines the scaling of this method. Because now you see all the curves are aligning, and there's some number here. We don't know exactly that number, but you can think there's a capacity here. There's some number. Um, you can prove this. There's a number here above which all these curves eventually will go to 1. You'll get correct encoding. And below that number, all of these curves will go to zero. So there's going to be a step function, a phase transition. And that's exactly what um, classical Shannon theory tells us about codes. So part of the challenge here is sort of figuring out why was that the right way in which to define rate? It's not a priori obvious. Um, you might suspect that it would have something to do with this, because remember I said for each node, there are p choose d neighborhoods. And log of p choose d is, d is roughly d times log of p. So you might have suspected it was d log p, but it's not. It's d squared. Um, so one has to work to understand that. That's essentially where lots of the work comes in here. But let me just state a precise theorem um, and sort of a pair of theorems. Um, and it tells you that for a certain class of graphs, there are some restrictions on the weights of this graph. Um, there are certain technical conditions that I won't go into detail here, but I'm happy to talk to you about offline. But under certain what are called incoherence conditions, um, what this says is the following, that um, this method, this is a polynomial time method, this says that if your sample size is larger than some constant times d squared log p, that's what we were rescaling by before, there's something else here. What is theta min? That's the minimum value of that weight. On every edge, you have a weight. It's a number. It's not zero. Obviously, if it gets very close to zero, your problem gets extremely hard. And so the difficulty of this problem scales like 1 over the square of that minimum value. So this is an achievability result. And what's important is that, at least in a certain range of this minimum value, it's telling you that d squared log p is, is the right order parameter. Now, we've sort of done this in a, we started with a particular method, right? I, I didn't start with the fundamental question of you know, what is a capacity over all methods. I started with a particular method. I said I'm going to run a polynomial time algorithm. It's going to use L1 regression. It's a convex optimization problem. And so it's possible in principle that actually this is not the sort of correct scaling for an optimal method. So. What you need to do here is the information theoretic question. There's a notion of capacity here. You, you need to ask if I did optimal decoding. That's a well-defined procedure. It's not, a, it's not a polynomial time procedure, because you'd have to search over all graphs of size p with d nodes. But we can analyze it. We can't implement it. If you analyze that, um, what you can show is that this is the right scaling law. Again, that there's some other constant. We don't know the capacity. These constants are not matching. But what we do know is that this is sort of the correct way of measuring complexity of graph selection in this regime. It's quadratic in the maximum degree. 
it's logarithmic in the number of nodes. So if you're below this threshold, then, um, well, I think what we proved, this is a paper with Prasad Sankham, we proved constant probability of error. Um, if you do somewhat more work, you can make the probability 1 minus O of 1. You can, uh, probability of error would be 1 minus O of 1. You can make the method uh, fail with very high probability. Okay, so that's an example. That's essentially an information theoretic result. Certainly, the necessary condition is using Thanos inequality. Um, but qualitatively, what I want you to take away is that in philosophy, this is very much an information theoretic result because what it's seeking is a scaling law, and it's seeking both achievability and converse results under that scaling law. Um, so in general, in learning problems, in particular high-dimensional learning problems, there are many such challenges of this form. And they use information threat techniques, but they involve challenges that do not appear in sort of standard coding problems. Um, essentially because our code books are, are not simple, right? Our code books are quite complicated. So let me just say a little bit about the proof of the lower bound. Essentially because I think this will be most familiar to you. Um, so how does one analyze this? Well, if you recognize this as an unorthodox channel coding problem, then what that says is that um, all the kinds of methods we have from information theory for converse results, uh, most notably Fano's um, inequality, all of these methods can be brought to bear. Um, so at some level, one could write a characterization of the capacity here that would involve the mutual information divided by the log of the number of code words. Um, and that's fine, that would be correct, but it's actually not that useful, right? It's not a single letter characterization. What we want is something in which we actually see structurally in the ensemble of graphs what matters. And so we need to bound the mutual information, we need to work a fair bit with it so that it reveals the dependence on D and P. Those are the structural parameters in our problem. Right, so this is the picture we've seen before. We've got some graph structure distribution. So our set of code words is um, a family of graphs. This is a discrete code book. We could count the number of graphs with maximum degree D on P vertices. That's some finite set. We have a bunch of channels. If I fix a graph, I'm fixing a particular form of this easing model that I defined, and I can draw samples from it. And our decoding problem is to map to graphs. Um, so what does one do? Well, you look at Fano's inequality. As I said, obviously you'd expect that this ratio is important. But the work is, this is not a useful statement to say the capacity is controlled by that. It's true. But what you want is you want to be able to say to a user, someone who's implementing a graph selection method, you want to say to them, under what regime, how many samples do you expect to need to be able to fit a graph of this size? So they come to you and they say, I have a graph that has 100,000 nodes. I think the maximum degree is maybe roughly 200. You want a result, like the result we have, that will give them roughly, you should need of this order many samples of this model to get a reasonable answer. So if you just told them, well, you need this ratio to be controlled, that would not be a useful statement. Um, so what one actually does here is you, um, you actually apply FANO not over the whole code book. It turns out to be useful to apply FANO over um, sort of sub code books. You choose code words that are in some sense, we're trying to be adversarial here, we choose code words that are hard to distinguish. Um, that's not something we normally do in coding theory, right? Because in coding theory we normally try and make a code book where all the code words are far apart and easy to distinguish. But this is a problem where we don't have control over the code book. Nature gave us the set of graphs. I can't do anything about that. And if I'm trying to study a fundamental limit, I can look for hard cases because I'm trying to prove a converse or a lower bound. Um, so here's a very hard ensemble. Um, we use multiple ones in our work, but this is an interesting hard one. So what do we do? Well, we take a set of P vertices and we divide it into P over D plus one groups, each of, one, each of which has D plus one nodes in it. Now, what do I do? Well, I can connect I have d plus 1 variables, I can connect all of them and form a d plus 1 clique that has maximum degree d, so that will belong to my family. So that's one graph. But how do I make the problem hard for you? Well, there are many code words that are close to this graph. 
Um, so what do I do? I can choose one of these cliques and I can just delete an edge from it. Right? It still has maximum degree at most D. But somehow it's very close to that graph. And I can choose some other one and delete some other edge. So here I chose this D peak, I deleted this edge. And I can keep doing this many, many times. So essentially what I'm, take, what I'm doing is I'm taking one graph and I'm making sort of a cloud of many other graphs, a large number of them that are very close to it. And um, if you want to do graph recovery correctly, you have to be able to distinguish between all of these graphs. And um, this ensemble is hard because when you analyze the kullback leibler divergence, for instance, between these two ensembles, right, that's going to tell you, if, if you're doing a testing problem, the kullback leibler divergence tells you how close things are. You want that to be big if you can test well. Um, the KL divergence between these two probability distributions indexed by these graphs it decays very, very fast in the, in the degree D. It decays exponentially in the degree unless the degree is sort of decaying like 1 over D. Um, so what that means is you pay an exponential price unless you make your edge weights relatively small. And if you combine this with other results, this is what leads to that D squared log P um, overall scaling law. Right, so it's the use of Fano's inequality, but it's Fano on a subset of the code book. And we're doing that because we're proving lower bounds. We want to sort of identify the hardest subsets of the problem. And this is one of them, as it turns out. OK, so any questions um, about this part before I move on? So this is sort of the main result of this part, that one can define a notion of graph selection. You can think about it as a channel decoding problem. And you can prove results that have the same kind of achievability and converse flavor as we do in a standard um, information credit analysis. Do you have a question? Yes. That's a very good point. So let me just repeat your question for others. His point was, these graphs are extremely close, right? They differ by just two edges. So your point is, maybe it's too harsh to say I get exact graph recovery. Why don't we formulate something like I get alpha fraction of the edges correct? So I look at Hamming distance on the indicator vectors. I think that makes much more sense. Um, you know, the other thing with learning problems is we don't believe our models. Our models are rough approximations to reality. So we shouldn't ask questions about our model that are very fine-grained. So you're exactly correct. This is an idealization. That's not the right question to ask. One should ask something like, are you in the correct neighborhood? We should do something like neighborhood decoding. And one can do that. Um, people have done this, for instance, Galen Reeves and um, Michael Gaspar have done this for sparse, uh, sparse um, estimation problems. Instead of getting the subset of a sparse vector exactly, get within some constant fraction handling distance of it. And that makes much more sense. Um, we studied this because in some ways that's the first question you would study and in some ways it's mathematically the most tractable. But you're exactly right, that's, that's a more sensible formulation. Any other points? Yeah? Uh, I didn't uh, understand clearly why the KL divergence uh, decays is one idea. Because uh, the probability of a single edge missing the left hand side graph is the same as the probability of a single edge missing the right hand side graph. Right? So, um, yes, yeah, so this is not obvious. I mean, this is a lemma and the lemma takes you know, five pages to prove. But let me give you the intuition of, of why they get very close. Um, think about it um, this way. So D is not four in practice. D is large, 50, 100, it's scaling. And think about it that you are one person, and um, you're connected to a very large number of other people with some positive weight. So that, and those people are all connected to all of their neighbors, right? You're almost a clique except for one edge. So whether I add this edge or don't add it, it has eventually a very, very small effect on the distribution. And as D scales, if those weights aren't small, what's going to happen is the distribution on this graph will concentrate on all plus ones or all minus ones. And once it does that, then it's almost impossible to tell whether or not this given edge appears. So that's why it decays exponentially sort of in the total sum of the edge weights. That's why you need a bound on these edge weights to make the problem tractable. And that's where the scaling law comes from. Yes, it's not obvious, but that is the essence of the proof, that 
you, you have to show that these are very hard in a precise sense. They're sort of exponentially hard to distinguish. Anything else? Yeah. Um, so our practical method does not know the degree. Uh, that's a good question. So this method is sort of adaptive. It doesn't know the degree, and it achieves this rate regardless of what the degree is. When we prove the lower bound, we give the algorithm the degree. Right? If the algorithm knows the degree, it only makes the results stronger. You could ask the question, if the algorithm doesn't know the degree, does it you know, make the lower bound even stronger? That, that would sort of be the price of adaptivity, it's called. So yeah, that's a good point. Um, so the questions are great, but I just want to sort of keep on time. Let me just introduce the next problem, and then we'll take a quick, um, maybe three, four minute break just to stretch our legs. So let me just um, do the high level introduction of the next um, vignette. So our next vignette is, is what? Um, our next vignette has to do with principal component analysis. Um, so principal component analysis is, is probably one of the most widely used procedures in basic data analysis. It's a pre-processing thing for many, many things that you might imagine. Um, and it's pretty simple. What does it do? It says, look at your data, make your data zero mean, sort of center it, and then compute some number of the eigenvectors of the sample covariance of your data, and you could reduce your dimension by projecting into the span of those eigenvectors. Um, so what it's basically doing is it's basically trying to find the directions in the space the, that suck up the maximal variance. The first eigenvector is the projection of your data that has the largest variance over all unit norm projections. So if you wanted to do a one-dimensional compression of your data using a linear projection in mean squared, in mean squared error, the first principal component is, is the optimal um, compression. Now, classically, PCA is very well understood. Um, classically, I mean when the dimension of your data, P, is fixed and N goes to infinity. Um, there are many classic texts about what happens in PCA. And it's, it's, it's a nice theory, it's beautiful, but it's well understood. What we're interested in here, and what many people in this area, again, is in scaling laws. You're interested in looking at problems where we're going to allow the dimension of our data to grow at the same time that the number of samples N grows. And um, the classical scaling law that people would look at is they would assume there's no structure, and they would let P, the dimension of the data, and N, the sample size, let that grow in some way, and let's look at the ratio. Now, it turns out that unless that ratio P over N goes to zero, then um, PCA is not very interesting. PCA will be inconsistent if you, for a fixed ratio P over N if you run um, SVD to compute eigenvectors, and you ask, are these getting close to the true eigenvectors, the eigenvectors of the population covariance matrix? Um, the answer is no. Um, there's an impossibility theorem, which again you can prove using information threat techniques, that unless P over N goes to zero, there's no way to estimate eigenvectors of a matrix consistently. So because of that impossibility theorem, people um, become interested in structure, and they become interested in things like sparse eigenvectors. Let me just give you a, a picture, and then I'll come back. Um, we'll do the precise model. So here in practice is how one might use PCA for um, face compression or face recognition. These are what are called eigenfaces. Um, so what do people do? They take a large database of faces. These are images. Each image is maybe 64 by 64. So P here is 64 squared. We would vectorize our images. N is the number of samples in our database. This is the Yale fail face database. What have I done? I've computed the first 25 maximal eigenvectors of the sample covariance matrix. And you can see what they look like. They look sort of face-like. And a data compression method for this data set would be instead of storing all the faces, instead of for each face storing a 64 square dimensional um, vector, I would project each face onto one of these images and I would store a 25 dimensional um, vector. That would be a form of face compression. And that actually, actually works very well. Um, Essentially, if you look at the eigenvalues of the covariance matrix of these faces, it decays very fast. Most of the variance is captured in the first 
20 to 40 or so. What people do with um, a structured form of PCA, this is um, sparse PCA, they would say instead of just looking for eigenvectors that are just dense in general, let's look for eigenvectors that have relatively few non-zeros. And what people find in practice is that for many data sets, if you look for sparse eigenvectors, you actually get much better performance, and you also get much more interpretable objects. So these are sparse eigenvectors that I've estimated from the same data set. And you can see the first few of them are certainly, you can see they're capturing features in, in a more recognizable sense than the ordinary um, principal components. So this is sort of one practical motivation of why we would study something like sparse principal components. Um, so what we're going to study is the following. Um, we're going to study, again, I'm trying to keep things as simple as possible, just looking at the idealized cases. There are many more general models, but we're going to study the rank one version of principal components where you just want a single maximal eigenvector. In practice, you want to estimate many, maybe 10 or 20 or some number, but let's just look at one eigenvector. And we're going to look at something that's called a spiked model. Um, this is something that's due to Johnstone, Ian Johnstone at Stanford. You look at a matrix, which is an identity matrix, plus a rank one matrix times some signal to noise ratio. So make this state a star, that's what we're trying to estimate. That's a, um, a Euclidean norm one vector. And then we use this parameter to sort of scale how um, high the signal to noise ratio is. Okay, so what is our code book here? Well, our code book here, in the sparse case, is going to be a, a set of vectors, theta star, that are sparse. And what does our channel, well, when we, our, what does our channel do? Well, our channel, if we fix some theta star with some covariance matrix, it's going to draw a zero mean vector that has this covariance matrix. Okay, so we're going to observe n uses of a channel, we're going to observe n vectors, each of which is p-dimensional, zero mean, and has a covariance that looks like this. And the decoding problem is to try and detect, well, what was this vector? Okay, so that's the ensemble that we'll, we'll study next. Um, let's just take a quick break, I think maybe three minutes, to stretch your legs, uh, relax, drink some water, um, and then we'll come back and talk about this.